Welcome to the Invite Health Podcast, where our degreed healthcare professionals are excited to offer you the most important health and wellness information you need to make informed choices about your health. You can learn more about the products discussed in each of these episodes and all that Invite Health has to offer at www.invitehealth.com slash podcast. First time customers can use promo code podcast at checkout for an additional 15% off your first purchase. Let's get started. Did you know that roughly one out of every 20 Americans has some form of an arrhythmia or an abnormal heart rhythm? That is a big issue. Now, most people have probably heard of the most common type of arrhythmia, and that is going to be atrial fibrillation. So today I want to focus a little bit about what arrhythmias actually are, what are some of the common signs and symptoms, as well as risk factors, and obviously what different nutrients can be beneficial when it comes to supporting the healthy, normal rhythm of the heart. So I'm Amanda Williams, MD, MPH, and we know that when it comes to an arrhythmia, this can affect pretty much anyone. Uh, We can look at people who are otherwise healthy and don't have any other types of heart disease. They don't have high blood pressure or coronary artery disease, but yet they end up with an abnormal heart rhythm. And this can be very, very alarming for someone to experience. You know, it some people describe it as like having this sensation of feeling their own heart beat, or maybe they feel faint or lightheaded or dizzy. And some people can actually experience chest pain or they get short of breath. So there's a lot of different ways in which arrhythmias can present themselves. And what we are really focusing in on is the electrical conduction system of the heart. And this is very intricate, but we recognize that when the firing system of the heart is off in any way, this can create all of these problems, including atrial fibrillation. When we look at the statistics on AFib, now this is very, very um, prevalent throughout the entire world. It's estimated that those numbers are up near 35 million people throughout the world have AFib. Now in the U.S., we see that number to be somewhere around uh, probably five to 10 million, kind of the the numbers aren't exactly clear um, because there's been multiple different studies. And when we're looking at the data, sometimes you know someone can present with AFib and then they're medicated uh, and that regulates the rhythm itself, um, but perhaps they weren't counted technically as having AFib. But we'll just say it's, you know, we, we definitely know it's at least, you know, that 5 million range, but it could be upwards as high as 10 million. And we also see that this is more prevalent in people over the age of 65. So when we look at people in that age bracket, we are looking at probably roughly about 10% of people who are 65 and older can experience AFib. Now that number is about 2% when we have people under the age of 65, which is still a relatively large number of people throughout this country that can be impacted by this abnormal heart rhythm. And as I mentioned, this can be very alarming if someone experience AFib. Now, Arrhythmias as a whole, there are many different types of arrhythmias. And unless you're a cardiologist, you're likely not to to necessarily know a lot of these. But, But one of the things that we recognize is when we are looking at the heart rate itself, and sometimes we refer to this as your pulse, um, and we can tell how fast the heart is beating through that pulse sensation. So when they're assessing your pulse, that's the same as testing your heart rate. How many beats per minute is your heart actually going at? A normal heart rate at rest is roughly around 50 to 100 beats per minute. Now, if we are below that, then that is considered to be bradycardic. If we are above that, then that is tachycardic. So 
the the faster the heart rhythm above 100 beats per minute, then we are tachycardic. If we are below 60 beats per minute, then we are bradycardic. Now, a lot of these things can be detected through different tests such as EKGs, for example, but understanding the heart's electrical conduction system, this is really the, the key thing because we have to understand the correlation between the atria and the ventricles. So we have the upper chambers, which is the atria, and then we have the ventricles, which are the lower chambers. So if we think of the heart as a house, we have upstairs and a downstairs. So the upstairs is your atria, the downstairs is your ventricle. And we know that we have these contracting and relaxing pumping mechanisms that occur. And this is occurring through this system of different nodes, as they are called. So if we have an issue that's going on within the SA node or the AV node, so the SA is the sinoatrial node, the AV node is the atrioventricle node, then we can start to have issues that arise. So understanding the types of arrhythmias, like I said, that's more in that setting of a cardiologist to, to really understand. But we know that there are things such as SVTs, which is supraventricular arrhythmias that begin in the atria itself, um, which can create issues with premature atrial contractions, which is giving kind of an extra heartbeat. Um, we know that there can be that rapid but regular heart rhythm that occurs and this usually comes on and ends suddenly. So it comes on fast and it ends uh, just as fast. But then we also look at the, the different types of atrial fibrillations and the different impulses that begin and spread throughout the atria. And they are going to travel over to that AV node. So this is where we run into the issue with atrial fibrillation. And then we also have atrial flutter. And this is caused by one or more of the rapid circuits within the atrium. So that is creating a flutter. So that's a little bit more organized and regular than traditional atrial fibrillation. So there's a lot of different um, ways in which this can be assessed, you know, looking at ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation, um, you know, QT wave elongations. It can be very, very complicated, but the one thing that we can certainly focus in on is the fact that we know that AFib, atrial fibrillation, that's going to be that most common presentation. And understanding that the underlying risk factors of arrhythmias can include people who are asymptomatic of other heart issues. But generally speaking, as a general rule, we understand that people who have high blood pressure, people who are overweight, people who have coronary artery disease, people with congestive heart failure, people with high levels of stress, diabetes, thyroid dysfunction, these are all folks that are going to get into that category of having a greater risk of the development of an arrhythmia, which can really be incredibly problematic if you happen to fall into one of those categories. Now, when we look at the different treatment options, and this is why I wanted to bring this up, because many of the different treatments that are geared towards um, irregular heart rhythm are generally blood thinners. And the reason for that is because if the heart is not pumping properly, so that electrical conduction system isn't working right, and the, the heart is not pumping out the blood at the rate and the force that it is supposed to. This can create an environment where the blood itself can almost become a little bit too thick. And in that situation, now we are a bit more prone to having a potential stroke or a heart attack. And so they will generally try to give things to thin out the blood. So this is why you'll hear people who have AFib are on blood thinners. Now, the issue is, is we are trying to stop something from occurring, the, the side effect of something that's wrong. So we have the irregular electrical conduction system that's creating these misfires and an abnormal heart rhythm. So what the traditional approach is, is, okay, well, we know that this has gone haywire, so let's try and stop a potential stroke, as opposed to let's try and get the heart back in rhythm. So this is kind of one of those things that we, we oftentimes have this very common debate 
in in medicine about because we should be trying to fix why the heart itself is misfiring and correct that. Now, we certainly can look at certain medications may be helpful, you know, calcium channel blockers, um, ablation therapy is certainly been shown to be very beneficial when the heart is out of rhythm. And obviously, if you have someone who ends up having to have a pacemaker put in, we know that that's going to be mechanically controlling that pulse or that that heart rate itself. But we have to look at other things. We have to look at, you know, dietary and lifestyle changes that can be beneficial. We have to think about following those heart healthy diets, such as a Mediterranean diet, getting adequate exercise, maintaining healthy body weight, finding ways to keep our stress levels low. Now, these may all seem like common knowledge things, but it's amazing, as I mentioned, how many people have arrhythmias, but yet aren't addressing those underlying triggers. Now, here's the key point to to notate. We know that the influx of certain electrolytes play a key and essential role in that electrical conduction system. So when we think about things like magnesium and potassium, for example, we know that this is very important when it comes to the way that the heart itself is going to signal those firing pathways. So if we are deficient, for example, in magnesium, this is going to impede the essential proper functioning of the heart. Many people who have abnormal heart rhythms also have abnormal magnesium levels. So we said we want to try and find that root cause. Many times we can look at those electrolytes and that imbalance that's occurring. So if we have deficient magnesium, that can create and set that storm rolling for the arrhythmia in the first place. So these are all the different things that we certainly know. Unfortunately, if you talk to most people who have AFib, they are probably not taking magnesium and have probably never heard of that correlation. They are probably also not taking an omega-3 fatty acid because if they're already on a blood thinner, their doctor may say, well, you don't want to take an omega-3 in conjunction because it may thin you out too much. So a lot of this is misinformation um, that traditional doctors just aren't trained in terms of the impact that those vitamins and minerals and obviously essential fatty acids are playing when it comes to maintaining the proper rhythm of the heart. So we look at things like coenzyme Q10, we can look at things like Hawthorne extract, um, we can look at NAC, for example. We know that NAC certainly has been shown to be very supportive when it comes to proper heart rhythm. And many studies have actually indicated that giving NAC postoperatively, when the heart itself is under more um, stress and shock, that NAC can actually reduce the incidence of postoperative atrial fibrillation. So many people go in for surgeries on a regular basis and are probably not given that kind of cocktail of magnesium, some CoQ10, a little NAC, and that's the unfortunate thing. So, you know, going back to kind of the the pathophysiology behind the arrhythmias and understanding that we have these two main categories. We have the tachycardia, which is the heart's going too fast, and we have that bradycardia, which is going too slow. And then, you know, looking at that fibrillation, which is kind of this irregular quivering effect that actually is what people are sensing. And so when we're looking at that occurring within the atria, this is why we have so many issues. And understanding, once again, that things such as low CoQ10, low magnesium, low omega-3s naturally occurring in the body can be the driving force to this. And the conventional treatment is always going to be, let's make sure you don't have a blood clot and end up with a stroke. So this is, you know, kind of that, that backbone to understanding arrhythmias 
and understanding the electrical impulses and how these are originating within the SA node. So that's that sinoatrial node. And this is basically it's what it is, it's kind of like the small mass of specialized tissue that's located within the right atrium itself. This is technically, quote unquote, the heart's pacemaker. And that electrical impulse causes the atria to contract. It squeezes that blood from the atria, so the upstairs part, down into the ventricle. And it passes through the AV node, which is your atrioventricle node, which then triggers the ventricles themselves to contract. So then that is going to pump out or force out the blood to the rest of the body. Now, this is, it seems quite simple, okay? So we have the blood and it's going out. We have the AV node and we have the SA node. It all seems, okay, that makes sense. But it's actually a very intricate um, series of events that occurs. And so, you know, if we have these triggered activities and an abnormal electrical activity in the heart cells themselves, this can lead to this abnormal heart rhythm. And there's many different ways in which this is happening. It can be a nodal issue. So the body's natural pacemaker is screwed up. It can be the electrolyte imbalance. It can be a potential you know, medication that someone's taking that leads to this. We know that there are many different ways in which a abnormal heart rhythm can actually present itself. And the the main thing to, to always understand is what can I do about that? Because once it occurs, we don't want to just kind of settle into the mindset of, well, I guess I just have an abnormal heart rhythm and now I just need to be on this medication. We have to look and say, well, you know, what other risk factors am I dealing with here? Am I overweight? Am I dealing with, you know, an unregulated or uncontrolled thyroid problem? Do I have high blood pressure that's not well controlled? You know, what if I start taking my blood pressure, you know, checking that every day at home? Will that help to get my blood pressure into a better range, which then may offset a potential arrhythmia? So, Thinking about all those things, you know, having that imbalance of electrolytes, you know, are you prone to dehydration? Are you dealing with chronic kidney disease, which can disrupt the normal electrolyte balance and fluid balance in the body, which can once again trigger an arrhythmia? You know, thinking about all these different things, you know, are you constantly stressed out? You know, maybe we need to focus in on the adrenals to support a better stress response so that we are not putting ourselves into that category of developing an arrhythmia. So these are all things that we definitely have to be cognizant of. We have to make sure that we are making those adjustments when it comes to our diet. We have to make sure that we are finding means to stay physically active and that we are incorporating in those key nutrients that are essential for proper heart rhythm, such as your omega-3 fatty acids. So fish oil and krill oil, we know that these can help to regulate the heart rhythm by helping to normalize the sodium and calcium channel functions within the cardiac myocytes. So it stabilizes the electrical activity within the heart. And these are things that, this is why omega-3s are so darn important. When we look at magnesium and potassium and seeing how they are intricately involved in the heart's electrical stability and maintaining functional blood levels, all of these things matter. And if we have magnesium deficiency, we already know that that can be directly linked to congestive heart failure and hypertension and chest pains and all of the different things that we know magnesium deficiencies cause. And same to be said of potassium and understanding that potassium levels are really important. And you know, when we look at people who are on different diuretic drugs that can throw off their potassium levels and this can create that cardiac electrical instability. And the hawthorn extract, 
For example, if you are looking at our Cardio HX formulation, which has the magnesium along with taurine and hawthorn extract, we know that the hawthorn helps with heart rhythm via that contractility. So the way that that pumping mechanism, once again, when we think about the atria and we think about the ventricle and all of our antioxidants, the glutathione, that's why NAC is so important, looking at vitamin C and vitamin E and coenzyme Q10, we know that many studies have shown a therapeutic role for coenzyme Q10 in impaired cardiac function, including arrhythmias. So there's many different things that we can turn to. We can look at rhodiola. Understand that rhodiola is not only going to be that adrenal adaptogenic herb to offset the negative effect of stress, but at the same time helps to generate cellular energy in the body. So all of these things are critically important to make sure that we don't fall victim to the statistic of being one of the many millions of Americans who have AFib or any other type of an arrhythmia. So definitely make sure that you pay attention to your heart, that you eat heart healthy, and that you are taking the key nutrients to optimize and support your cardiovascular system. So that is all that I have for you for today. I wanna thank you so much for tuning in to the Invite Health Podcast. And remember, you can find all of our episodes for free wherever you listen to podcasts or by visiting invitehealth.com slash podcast. Now, do make sure that you subscribe and you leave us a review. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Invite Health. And we will see you next time for another episode of the Invite Health Podcast.